Okay, so uh, today we're going to be talking about Chapter 5, uh, which covers basically what allows us to gain images for the cubic multiple. Uh, so uh, we first begin with looking at the basic scheme of data acquisition. Uh, first, we see that the X-ray tube and the detectors have to be in perfect alignment. I notice that we have to be perfect alignment. They can't be slightly off because any variation will lead to uh, increased patient dosage without any noticeable gain in energy. Uh, also, the tube and detector scan the patient to collect a large number of transmission measurements. So, as we know, there are a large number of transmission measurements uh, that have to go into defining what an image is. Uh, the beam is shaped by special filters as it leaves the tube. I will go over those in a little while. Uh, the beam is collected to pass through only the slice of interest. And so uh, only the applicable area is what is actually getting scanned here. So uh, we don't scan areas that don't need to be scanned. Uh, the beam is attenuated by the patient and the transmitted photons are then measured by the detector. Uh, so we see attenuation occurs and then measurements are gained by the detector. And so those are things that we need to keep in mind. Uh, the detector then converts x-ray photons into an electrical signal. And so the detector goes uh, with the x-ray photons from photons to an electrical signal. Important to remember. Uh, these signals are then converted by the analog to digital converter into digital data. So there is an analog to digital converter, which as we know, uh, all of our data and computer tomography is of the digital uh, quantity. And number eight is the digital data is sent uh, to the computer for image reconstruction. So and the computer then gains all of this digital data and it manipulates this data into something that we can know and see as an image. Uh, so here we have just a little diagram of how everything is. Uh, we have our tube here. So this is our tube. And then at our tube, as the photons are coming out, we have our filter, which is going to really shape the beam to what we want it to be. Uh, notice that we have a scan field of view, which is uh, basically your gantry aperture uh, with the patient inside of this. And so, as we can see, a beam is coming down and is striking the detector here. But notice that there is a detector collimator here, which is allowing only this uh, to actually, uh, the beam to actually find the detector. Also notice that we have three patient collimators here as well. Uh, we'll see that some, uh, that scheme has sometimes shifted uh, in computer tomography with the newer uh, top standards so that we don't actually have all of these things. Uh, but this is just a generalized layout. And so as we see the detector, uh, then takes photons and then we begin converting them into electrical signals and then from electrical signals we go into digital data and so that is how we actually take uh, something that is not digital and make it digital uh, for use of step-based processes and so as you can see all of these processes from here to here uh, go on each image. So basically all of these processes have to occur for every image to come up on a screen. And as you'll notice, uh, the moment that you allow the scan to begin, uh, almost instantaneously images begin popping up on your screen. And so all of these processes are carried on in a rapid fashion. It's very impressive how computer tomography handles all of this. So there are three types of data acquisition geometries. Uh, we'll go over these uh, when we get to algorithms a little more heavily. Uh, but what I want you to know is there is three things. Parallel beam is much what the name implies. All of the beams are parallel. There is no 
uh, interaction between the beams. A fan shape beam is much like this. And so, as you can see, uh, the beam top is kind of divergent here. And so, uh, notice that there is a divergent top pathway here. And then that brings us to spiral geometry, which is, as the name implies, a spiral, which goes something like that. Uh, as the patient is moved in this direction here. And so uh, we see that uh, computer tomography nowadays is a combination of fan and spiral. Those are really what we have to deal with. And so it's going to present a lot of interesting uh, quandaries and questions uh, about how this actually comes about and how we can actually acquire the scan. And so uh, we'll find out later in our lectures that there are means that the technology has to take to actually allow us to get effective and adequate images. But those are the differences in the beam pops. Uh, on this image, we see that we have uh, basically parallel. So this is basically a parallel beam top. As you can see, uh, there is equal spacing between each of the wave or the beam. And so there is no crossing over. Uh, if we had a fan, then it would go something like this but we don't so this is a parallel uh, this is a spiral beam top uh, as we've already seen this is spiral and notice how it creates basically a circular pathway around the patient that's that's the reason that we call it a spiral and so each rotation is acquiring bits and pieces of uh, the patient and so uh, we see that it begins usually scans begin here and then uh, the patient is moved in this direction uh, one thing I want to clarify right now is that uh, this is the z-axis uh, typically we think of X and Y as being the only two axes. So this would be y and x, which would translate into uh, up and down and side to side. Uh, but as we can see in computer tomography, the patient actually moves in a different axis. And so that is the z axis. And so this is the way that the patient is actually moving here. As the scan progresses and the patient is removed from the ventry, uh, the patient is coming out in the z-axis. And I realize that can sometimes lead to a lot of confusion, uh, but uh, we'll go over that as we begin uh, talking about more of the scanning uh, in just a few minutes. Uh, we can't be so naive to think that we have always had uh, these scanners that we have today uh, to where we can scan things uh, very rapidly and acquire excellent images because scanning has not always yielded that. Uh, we've had several generations. We had first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh generation scanners. Uh, let me go back. And so Basically, uh, what we have here is that uh, the first generation yielded parallel beams, much like this, and translate rotate motions. And so basically, uh, we'll go over that in just a few minutes. But 
basically how it worked was the bean, uh, you would require one slice, and then you would move, and then it would rotate again, and then acquire another. Uh, second generation is where we have introduction of fan beam geometry, and so we see we have this type of geometry, but we still keep the translate rotate motion. A third generation we have fan beam, but we also introduce a complete rotation of the tube and detectors, meaning that we now have spiral or helical scanning being able to progress. So we have complete rotation of the tube, uh, and that's brought about because of the technology that exists. Uh, the difference between the third and fourth generation of scanners, and there is a difference here, um, is that there is a complete rotation of the tube, but it's around a solid ring of detectors. Uh, if you'll notice here, we have in the third generation we have complete rotation of the tube and detectors, but we don't have rotation of the two, of the detectors in fourth generation uh, machines. So basically, there's a stationary detectors, uh, a ring of detectors. So write this on your PowerPoint stationary. Uh, for your detectors, but your tube is still in motion. And as we see images, that will make more sense. A uh, fifth generation is high speed CT. Uh, sixth generation is multiple tubes and detectors. So uh, you run two tubes and two sets of detectors, and so both are uh, basically uh, 90 degrees apart. So you have one here, and then you have another here. And so this will be our detectors. And so uh, basically, we have a 90 degree angle here between the two tubes. Uh, seventh generation is, is uh, utilizing flat panel digital detectors. However, we have not been able to actually uh, use those to uh, some adequacy right now. So we're still in the process of actually uh, building up those flat panel detectors and seeing how they they can be best utilized for computer tomography. Uh, still a little ways away from that. Uh, the important thing to remember is that most of the scanners that we use today are based on third generation technology. So this is what we have. Um, most of the time third generation uh, scanners are just demonstrated to be just as effective as, as fourth generation and fourth generation are a little more complex than third generation. So uh, here we have basically um, this is first, this will be second, Uh, this will be third, and this will be fourth generation. Okay, uh, so uh, definitely know this image. As you can see here, you have parallel beams. So we have parallel. But we also have this translate rotate motion. Notice how it the tube moves in this direction. And then, after it reaches this point here, it rotates and becomes this, and then scans this way. And then it will reach this point, and then begin here, begins here, and then will translate to here, and then work its way uh, to this point, and probably. Uh, have to unwind and go back. Uh, the second uh, generation of scanners has the same translate rotate motion. As we can see, we move over this way and then we rotate down, translate, and then rotate and translate again. And, but the only difference here is that we have a fan beam on the second uh, generation. So keep that in mind, fan beam for the second generation. 
Uh, the real thing that we're interested in is the third and fourth generation. As we can see, a uh, third generation has the fan beam. Notice how they all originate at one location, but they all spread out and diverge from each other. But underneath this area, we have the, t the detectors. And notice uh, that we don't have detectors lining all of this arc here, but we only have it in one specific location. And so the tube and the detectors are linked up to a point to where when the tube rotates, the detectors rotate as well. And so you scan 360 degrees around the patient. The fourth generation is uh, very much different. As we can see, we have the fan beam. So there's a commonality between third and fourth in the fact that they both use fan beams. But the difference is that there is a two, there is a, a circle of detectors. And so while there is only a one location for the detectors in third generation, uh, the whole area is comprised, or the whole circle is comprised of detectors on the fourth generation. And so pretty much the tube just rotates inside of this ring of detectors. So um, I put this image on here just to kind of demonstrate to you how everything has really changed what we're doing in computer tomography. Uh, this little area here is four slices. Uh, and so if we quadruple that, we get 16 slices. Then we get 64 slices. And then if we want to get the entire heart, pretty much, we use 256. So 256 is capable of imaging the entire heart or most of the heart in one rotation. And so uh, pretty pretty amazing uh, that we have that capability here. So that brings us to the first generation scanners. Uh, as we've already discussed, we have the parallel beam geometry. We have parallel beam geometry. And as we saw, it uses parallel rays to generate a projection profile. Uh, also, we have the translate rotate motion, uh, which, as we saw, uh, the translate rotate is a single highly collimated x ray beam and one or two detectors. First, translate across the patient to collect transition readings. So, after one translation, so as we saw, after it moves horizontally, uh, the tube and detector rotate by one degree and translate again to collect readings from a different location. It's repeated for 180 degrees. So keep that in mind, it only goes on for 180 degrees, or so you only get halfway around the patient. And then the cable has to unwind, and then you begin the process over again. And it's known as rectilinear pencil beam scanning. Now the thing you want to take in mind from uh, the first generation scanners is this, that it took at least 4.5 to 5.5 minutes to produce a complete scan. Okay, uh, so basically it's going to take you 4 to 5 minutes to produce one scan. And so uh, if the patient has multiple scans, uh, then that's going to further increase the amount of time that the patient's going to be in uh, the CT suite. Uh, also, uh, image reconstruction algorithm was based on parallel beam geometry. And so everything that was reconstructed and how to reconstruct was based on the type of beam geometry. Uh, but the one thing that I want you to take from the first generation is that it was ineffective. So basically, uh, in, in the beginning of CT, that's, this is the type of scanner that we would have had. Uh, but 
CTE really hadn't hadn't come into its own yet, and so it wasn't as effective as it could have been. And so uh, this four to five minutes here in trauma situations uh, wouldn't quite work out adequately. So that's why uh, first generation scanners uh, had to be improved on. And uh, to improve on these, uh, we have uh, the second generation scanners, which kind of build on or they're based on the first generation scanners, uh, but they have a few differences. They have a linear detector array. And so uh, you have a larger area of detectors, and you have a multiple pencil beam. And so basically, uh, you have the fan beam here. Uh, the result is a beam geometry that describes a small fan whose apex originates at the X ray tube. And so uh, the smallest area or the apex of all of these fans. Uh, let me draw a larger area here. This area here would be the apex. It's the most narrow, and it's, um, that is the apex, which is where everything originates, which is located in the X ray tube or at the X ray tube. Uh, the X rays are divergent instead of parallel. Are resulting in a significant change in the imagery construction algorithm. So based on second generation scanner technology, there had to be a lot of improvement in terms of how to reconstruct these images to actually acquire uh, an adequate uh, computer tomography scan so that everything wasn't in vain. And so it became very uh, important to figure out how to actually utilize imagery construction here. But once again, uh, these scanners still were not the fastest and still not as effective. Uh, still in regards to second generation scanners, we see that the beam, the beam translates across the patient to collect a set of transmission readings. After one translation, the tube and detector rotate by larger increments, increments and translation begins. And the thing to remember is that this is referred to as rectilinear multiple, pen, multiple pencil beam scanning. And so, uh, basically, fine beams coming down in a fan shape uh, is what we're talking about here. It did result in shorter scan times between 20 seconds and three and a half minutes. Uh, so we're still looking at three and a half minutes, which is a long time to actually be in the CT suite uh, nowadays uh, for just one little scan. The time decrease is inversely proportional to the number of detectors. Uh, we see that we have more detectors which will lower scanning time. And so that we'll see that that actually applies even into uh, the multi-row detectors uh, that we have now. We're increasing the amount of detectors actually decreases the scan time. So uh, keep this in mind, detectors increase and time decreases. So the more uh, detectors you have, the less amount of time that it's going to take to acquire the scan. So that brings us to third generation scanners. Uh, they're based on fan beam geometry that rotates continuously around the patient 360 degrees. So that's something to keep in mind. We're using 360 degrees now instead of 180. So uh, all the other scanners use 180, but not third generation. Uh, the X-ray tube is coupled to a curved detector array that subtends an arc of 30 to 40 degrees or greater from the apex of the fan. So basically, uh, your X-ray uh, detectors are curved simply so that they can accommodate all of this fan beam. Uh, as the X-ray tube and detectors rotate, Projection profiles are collected and a view is obtained for every fixed point of the tube and detectors. And so basically, uh, you're gaining images 360 degrees around the patient. Uh, the path traced by the tube describes a circle rather than a semicircle, a uh, characteristic of the previous generations. And so, uh, as we see, uh, helical scanning, spiral scanning, 
requires that you continuously move in a circle as the patient is going through the entry. And that's what we see uh, embodied in third generation scanners, much different than uh, first and second scanners. I may exhibit a further decreased scan times and limited artifact production. So as we know, our scan times have drastically been reduced to where we can actually acquire images very rapidly. And so there are two types of fourth generation scanners. Uh, the first type is a rotating fan beam within a stationary ring of detectors. And so basically, uh, this is what you're going to see if you have a fourth generation scanner. As we see that the mutating or fan beam scanner, uh, which the fan or the x-ray tube is located outside of the mutating ring of detectors, is not even manufactured now. So uh, we won't even worry about this. So I'm just going to mark this off here. Uh, but we're going to worry about the rotating uh, fan beam within the stationary ring of detectors. So you have your x-ray tube here and you have your ring of detectors I realize that this is a very pretty drawing uh, but hopefully you'll grasp the meaning more so than what the drawing looks like uh, you have fan beam originating here uh, from the tube and striking this ring of detectors. And as the tube rotates, the tube goes around this way and keeps on rotating, uh, the detectors stay stationary. The detectors don't move, it's only the tube moving inside of uh, this ring. And so that is a fourth generation scanner. Uh, as you can see here, uh, you have the tube. This is this is a fourth generation scanner once again. And as we can see, uh, we have uh, the X-ray tube here. As the X-ray tube moves around the patient and completing a 360 degree rotation, uh, the detectors stay stationary. So that's important to keep in mind. The detectors are not actually moving, they're staying stationary, and only the x-ray tube is rotating. So the main data acquisition features of a fourth generation scanner are uh, the X-ray tube is positioned within the stationary circular detector array. So we see that the X-ray tube is inside or within. Uh, the beam geometry describes a wide fan. So there can be a wide fan array here. Uh, the apex of the fan now originates at each detector. And so instead of the apex resulting in or at the tube, it actually results or originates at the detector. And uh, if we go back to our previous image, uh, we see that the apex is right here. That corresponds to this detector. And so actually the apex is here. Uh, as the tube moves from point to point within the circle, Single rays strike a detector. Uh, scan times are very short and vary from scanner to scanner depending on the manufacturer. So uh, that is the real draw for fourth generation is that scan times are really short. Uh, the x-ray tube traces a circular path much the same way that uh, the third generation scanner does, but it's only the x-ray tube here. And so you might want to write only x-ray tube here. Uh, the image reconstruction algorithm is only uh, for a fan beam geometry in which the apex of the fan is now at the detector as opposed to the x-ray tube in the third generation system. So uh, that's the important thing to keep in mind here that uh, once again 
the apex of the fan beam is at a detector now, not actually at the tube. And because of the capability to image 16 slices and greater, fan beams have now become cone beams. And so I realize that this may not make a whole lot of sense, uh, what a cone beam is. Uh, and I will demonstrate to you uh, on this image here, or this slide, uh, what a cone beam actually is. So, uh, if we have the detect uh, the tube here, and this is the z-axis, and we're looking at it inside, we're going to say this is z-axis or side view. Okay, so we have the tube here, and so we have this beam coming down. It goes like this like this okay and the patient is seated is seated inside of this the patient is in this area so if we notice we have rays coming down here 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 coming out all over the place and because of this uh, as the tube rotates around uh, the patient it's not simply just a spiral like this but it's actually wider and it's because that there is a, it's a three-dimensional beam not only just a one-dimensional or two-dimensional beam it actually has depth to it and that makes it a cone beam. Uh, so that's what we're talking about uh, in terms of cone beams. Uh, but if we look at fifth generation now, we see that uh, they're classified as high speed CT scanners because they can acquire scan data in milliseconds. So we're talking about milliseconds here. Uh, two prominent types are the electron beam CT scanner the dynamic spatial reconstructor. Uh, typically what you're what you're hearing about is the electron beam scanner. Uh, very rapid, very fast. Uh, the sixth generation scanner. Uh, this scanner consists of two x-ray tubes, two sets of detectors which are offset by 90 degrees. Uh, similar to what we what I drew before, you have a tube here and a tube here, and then the detectors there and you have a 90 degrees of separation. It's designed for cardiac CT because it provides the temporal resolution needed to image moving structures such as the heart. And so basically what you're doing is you're acquiring a lot of data very rapidly and that's why it's only uh, going to become practical at the moment for cardiac CT because that is what we really have to worry about. That's what we really haven't been able to control motion on because you can't tell your heart to stop. Uh, we typically uh, tend to remedy this by using uh, uh, cardiac gating, but cardiac gating can only go so far, and so uh, that is why sixth generation scanners uh, in the future may become very prevalent, just simply for utilization uh, with cardiac CT. A seventh generation scanners uses flat panel digital detectors similar to those used in digital radiography. Uh, so. Uh, we're taking what is what we developed for digital radiography and then applying it uh, to computer tomography. And the important thing to remember is that it's still in the developmental stages and we don't really know when it's actually going to come about or prove viable. Uh, so there's a lot of things that have to be taken into consideration before we actually get uh, two seven generations. Okay, um, slip ring technology. That is one of the big things that has actually allowed uh, computer tomography to progress the way that it has. Uh, so slip ring uh, is what makes spiral helical CT possible. Uh, remember that we said uh, previously that the early generation scanners had this really big problem to where 
they had to only scan 180 degrees of the patient, and then they had to actually unwind their cable so that they could begin at a fresh point and scan again, unwind the cable. And because of that, scan times became notoriously uh, long. And because of that, CT wouldn't necessarily be used for all of these situations. A uh, slip ring technology has really enabled uh, CT to be the go-to thing or the go-to examination for many things uh, such as trauma, uh, pulmonary embolism, and things like that because we can acquire images very rapidly and uh, see pathology very quickly. And so uh, the definition of slip ring, so we need to definitely know that, is an electromechanical device consisting of a circular, so it's circular, electrical conductive rings and brushes that transmit electrical energy across a rotating interface. And so basically what this big definition says is that it allows the tube to rotate continuously. So uh, basically the tube is going to rotate continuously. Uh, scanners that incorporate slip ring design are referred to as continuous rotation or volume CT. I would typically go by this now. If your scanner can acquire volume images uh, then or helical images, then it has a slip ring in it. Uh, slip ring technology allows very fast scan times, which are needed in such procedures as CTA. We all know that uh, CTAs require very fast scan times. Uh, but also, we have things like P studies, cardiac, uh, and even just a simple uh, lung scan or a chest CT. So just even a chest CT to see the lungs uh, allows, uh, in a very small breath hold, scans to be accomplished. And we see the slip rings provide the electrical power to operate the tube and also transfer signals from the detectors for the input to the image reconstruction computer. So they all actually do two things, uh, provide power and then transmit signals. So very important for uh, the slip rings to be inside. So there are basically uh, two designs for power and supply. Well, the first is the disk. Uh, which the conductive rings for concentric circles and the plane of rotation. Uh, so basically there are concentric rings inside and they allow uh, power to be supplied. Uh, the cylinder on the other hand includes conductive rings positioned along the axis of rotation to form a cylinder. And so I uh, will actually look at pictures of these in just a second. Uh, we see that the brushes that transmit electrical power to the CTE components glide in contact grooves with the stationary slip rings. So there are grooves inside the slip rings that allow these brushes to glide, which allow power to be transmitted. Uh, there are two, two types of brushes. Uh, we have the wire brush, uh, which uses conductive wire as a, as a sliding contact. Uh, so the wire is gliding on this on the, the tube and because of that or the cylinder and because of that it actually allows contact to be made or a composite brush uh, which uses a block of some conductive materials such as silver graphite as a sliding contact uh, so uh, either way uh, we find that this enables slip rings to actually function so what are the brushes uh, a, a brush consists of one or more wires arranged such that they function as a cantilever spring with a free end against the conductive ring. And so basically uh, what you're doing is you are allowing the brushes to stay in contact with the tube or, or the cylinder and allow uh, conductivity to actually occur. Uh, two brushes per ring are often used to increase either communication reliability or current carrying capacity. So you're looking usually at two brushes per ring. Uh, it eliminates the long high tension cables to the x-ray tube. And so with the brushes 
That's why we typically do not have high tension cables in x ray field uh, These cables were once used in start stop scanning where they would have to be unwound. So, as we've already discussed, uh, the unwinding of cable, this has all become unnecessary now because of uh, slip rings and the brushes that allow slip rings to function. So, we have a low voltage slip ring. Uh, in a low voltage slip ring system, 480 alternating power and x ray control signals are transmitted to the slip ring by means of a low voltage brush. Uh, the slip ring then provides power for the high voltage transformer, which subsequently transmits high voltage to the x ray tube. Uh, in this case, the x ray generator, generator x ray tube, and other controls are positioned on the orbital scan frame. Uh, and so that'll make sense when we actually look at an image. A high voltage slip ring and a high voltage slip ring system, the AC delivers power to the high voltage generator, which subsequently supplies high voltage to the slip ring. Uh, the high voltage from the slip ring is transferred to the x ray tube. In this case, the high voltage generator does not rotate with the x ray tube. And so there are two types uh, the low voltage. If we make a list here on high voltage and low voltage, we see that um, the generator and the tube rotate. In a high voltage, only the tube. Is going to rotate. So that's the difference here. Uh, in low voltage, you have to generate high, high or high voltage, and because of that, you have to use step ups and things like that. And it requires that the actual generator rotate with the tube. A high voltage does not require this. So uh, here we have basically. Uh, the slip ring uh, located inside the gantry and we have a basically concentric circles here which is uh, evident of the disk top slip ring. Uh, here we have actually the voltage coming in and here's the slip ring and we have grooves here uh, for the slip ring brushes to actually glide in and provide conductivity to the slip ring so here's the slip ring These are grooves. We actually don't see our water brushes, but they are located somewhere here. And uh, so we have voltage coming in here and then being transmitted to the slip ring and allowing the extra tube to actually be supplied. So uh, this kind of goes far beyond what the registry is going to ask you. But the advantages of slip ring technology, uh, we see that we have faster scan times and minimal inner scan delays. So that's what you really associate with uh, slip rings. It means that you're basically cutting your scan time in half simply with the same scanner uh, by allowing continuous rotation. And it doesn't take a long time to go in between scans. As we all know, pretty much instantaneously you can go into the next scan. Whereas if you had completed a scan, you would have to wait for the cable to be unwound and the actual tube to come in position again. We don't have to worry about that with slip rings. We have continuous acquisition protocols. Uh, you've probably saw runoff series where you uh, follow the aorta all the way down into the feet, uh, the blood flow all the way down into the feet uh, from the aorta. And uh, this is what continuous acquisition protocols are 
actually tailored for. Uh, we have things where we can scan, or protocols where we can scan from a chest all the way down to pelvis in a huge area or a huge volume, which would have normally been unthinkable outside of slip ring technology. Uh, we also have elimination of the start stop process. So uh, basically, uh, the conventional scanners had start and stop and then patient movement, start, stop, patient movement, start, stop, patient movement. And that was a process that was repeated until the scan was completed. However, uh, we don't have that now. And then the ultimate thing is the removal of the cable wraparound process. And simply the removal of the cable uh, wraparound process is what each of these are really speaking of. And so, uh, basically to summarize it, it's just the removal of the cable, around, uh, cable wraparound process. So then that brings us to the components of an x-ray system, or what allows images to be acquired and uh, to be actually transmitted. So we see the only components of the x-ray system are going to be these. Uh, we have the x-ray generator, the x-ray tube, x-ray beam filter, and then the collimators. And so that is what is going to allow the x-ray uh, to be produced and then to be transmitted. Uh, the x-ray generator, uh, CT now uses three-phase power for efficient production of x-rays. However, uh, this book is kind of weird in the fact that it tells you that we use three-phase power but we actually don't use three-phase power any longer. Uh, so mark this out because we typically don't use three-phase power any longer. What we do use is this. Uh, the CT scanner, unlike the old technology, which was three-phase, so we'll say three-phase equals old. Um, we now use high frequency generators. So that's what you want to keep in mind uh, because there is less drop off and so you have more of an even amount um, or an even frequency that is generated here. It, they're small, compact, and more efficient than conventional generators. Uh, what we really worry about is the efficiency. Uh, they are located inside the CT gantry, so that's another thing to keep in mind. Inside the gantry. And some scanners, it's mounted on the rotating frame with the x-ray tube. So it can be mounted on the frame or rotate with the x-ray tube. And as we saw, this would be indicative of low voltage slip rings. So keep that in mind. In other words, it's located in the corner of the gantry and does not rotate with the tube. So if it's located in the corner of the gantry, that's because we have a high voltage slip ring. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, if your generator is rotating, then it means it's a pretty good indicator that you have a low voltage slip ring. On the other hand, if it's if it isn't rotating, then it's a pretty good indicator that you have a high voltage slip ring. So that's going to be something that uh, you don't want to get tripped up on. Uh, I would doubt that you would have uh, questions this in depth uh, for exams, but um, you never know. You might see one question about uh, you've got a, a generator that rotates. What type of slip ring would you have? Uh, so just keep that in mind and my PowerPoint has taken off here okay the x-ray generator in a high frequency generator uh, the circuit is usually referred to as a high frequency inverter circuit uh, the low voltage low frequency current which is 60 Hertz from the main power supply is converted to high voltage high frequency current from 500 to 25,000 Hertz. Uh, so just know these numbers here. Uh, each component changes the low voltage, low frequency AC waveform to supply the X-ray tube with high voltage, high frequency direct current of almost constant potential. 
And so basically, what we're wanting, what we need for CTE is we need high voltage. direct current and we need high frequency and the reason for high frequency is as we've talked about uh, there are not a lot of variations between uh, the wavelengths or the frequencies here and because of that uh, you pretty much always get the same potential and that is something that you have to have for CT you can't have all of these variations because uh, it would make scanning very inefficient and image quality would be degrading because of this uh, so after high voltage rectification and smoothing uh, the voltage ripple from high frequency generators is less than 1% compared to 4% for a three phase generator uh, so keep that in mind, uh, circle this, high frequency generator has a ripple of less than 1% and so that's why we now use high frequency generators. Uh, the power ratings of CT generators vary and depend on the CT vendor, however typical ratings can range from 20 to 100 kilowatts. Uh, so keep that in mind again. Also, uh, refer to image uh, 515 in your book uh, so that you can see this. So, the X ray tube. Uh, the radiation source requirement in CT depends on two factors a radiation attenuation, which is a function of radiation beam energy, and the quantity of radiation required for transmission. So, as we saw with uh, Helmsfield in his first scanners uh, they used a gamma source for the production uh, needed for CT however the gamma sources were inefficient at best and so that's why scan times were excruciatingly long so we remedy that by using x-ray tubes now uh, but these x-ray tubes are highly specialized uh, we see that first generation and second generation used fixed anode or cooled x-ray tubes. And basically rotating the anode uh, x-ray tubes had become common in CT. And so the fixed anode uh, CT is now not used. Uh, we favor a rotating anode now. Our rotating anode tubes produce a heterogeneous beam of radiation from a large diameter anode disc with focal spot sizes to facilitate the spatial resolutions. Uh, I know this is a lot of big words and a lot of complex thoughts here, but what we're focusing on is a heterogeneous beam. That's really what, you, what I want you to understand. The heterogeneous beam means uh, that you don't have a lot of varying uh, degrees of energy, but pretty much everything is equal. And that's what we strive for on CT so that we can acquire uh, the best images possible. And because of that, uh, we, that's what we're striving for is a heterogeneous beam. Uh, the disc is usually made of rhenium, tungsten, and molybdenum uh, alloy, and other materials with small target angle. Uh, the angle is usually 12 degrees. So keep that in mind target angle for your uh, NO disc is usually around 12 degrees. And a rotation speed of 3600 to 10,000 RPM. Also keep that in mind. Uh, the introduction of spiral helical CT with continuous rotation scanners has placed new demands on X-ray tubes. Uh, so uh, due to the fact that we acquire images 360 degrees around the patient and we have these uh, more lengthy scan protocols now, uh, we see that CT tubes have a high, high specialization and a high demand uh, placed on them. And because the tube rotates continually for a longer period compared with conventional scanners, the tube must be able to sustain higher power levels. And so that means that you have to be able to continue scanning for a longer amount of time. This has forced the tube envelope, cathode assembly, anode assembly, and target design to be redesigned. 
and um, basically we see uh, that two technology has improved a great deal to allow us, us to facilitate scanning patients with a higher degree of accuracy. So the glass envelope uh, of the x-ray tube ensures a vacuum and provides structural support of anode and cathode structures and provides high voltage insulation between the anode and the cathode. Uh, so basically the x-ray tube creates a vacuum and then provides high voltage insulation. Uh, initially they were made with borosilicate glass however now tubes are designed with metal envelopes. So we have uh, usually metal envelopes which help to eliminate the internal arcing that occurred with glass envelopes. So uh, important to keep in mind, we now, not, we now don't use glass envelopes. And metal envelopes have ceramic insulators that isolate the metal envelope from the anode and cathode voltage. Very important uh, to have these ceramic insulators. Uh, without ceramic insulators, we would have uh, pretty much uh, the anode and cathode voltage interacting with the metal envelope and pretty much destroy the tube. Uh, typically, we have larger anode disc, so we're looking for larger anode disc, which allow the technologists to use higher tube currents. Uh, and a lot of people get so focused that it allows us to use uh, higher tube currents, but I really think the benefit of this is this. Uh, and keep this in mind uh, pretty much star this uh, that it allows you to have a greater heat storage capacity uh, I remember when I graduated uh, from the radiological technology program and I was at, a, at our small facility we were using an old scanner uh, very old um, and scan times were notoriously long and we had a back door to uh, our control room that opened to the outside um, and there was no one around and there would be many times where we'd have a uh, CT uh, cervical spine, thoracic spine and lumbar spine and we might be able to get through almost the thoracic spine without actually having tube heat problems but we, once we got through the thoracic spine getting ready to go to the lumbar spine and mind you, this might be a trauma case. Uh, we would actually acquire a wait time. Many times the wait time would be like 10, 15 minutes. And there would be this little box that, box that popped up on our screen that said, you have to wait this long before you can scan. Or you have to adjust your protocols. And so we would always try and adjust our protocols, uh, tone everything down as, as much as we could. And many times we still weren't able to actually scan the patient. And so we would have to open up the back door uh, and hopefully get some cool air coming into uh, the control room that we could pull, we could point a fan from the control room to blow into the patient room and allow it to actually get uh, to the scanner to allow it to cool itself down a little quicker. Uh, and I remember many times fanning the back door trying to get air to circulate in so that we could progress with the scan because uh, we had multiple scans to do and we needed to get this patient imaged as fast as possible to see if there was trauma. And so uh, through the use of higher ability to store heat and more effective ways to dissipate heat, uh, we see that modern scanners don't necessarily have these problems now. And you can, and you can acquire scans uh, at a very rapid pace without any worry about overheating the tube. So uh, the cathode assembly consists of one or more tungsten filaments positioned in a focusing cup. Uh, so uh, they have to be focused. Uh, it's usually made of barium to ensure a vacuum by the absorption of air molecules released from the target during operation. Uh, the anode assembly consists of the disc, rota rotor, stud, hub, rotor, and bearing assembly. Um, large anode disc is thicker than conventional disc and have one of three basic designs. And so, uh, once again, we see the anode is larger now. And 
uh, we see that it's thicker as well. So not only is it larger in diameter, but it's also thicker. Um, the three designs are all metal, uh, brazed graphite disc, and the chemical vapor deposition or the CVD graphite disc. And so uh, here we can see differences uh, in the metal. Um, we have an all metal disc here. We have metal here and graphite here. And then we have uh, pretty much all graphite there. So that brings us to x-ray tubes once again. Uh, in conventional tubes, the all-metal disc consists of a base body made of titanium, zirconium, and molybdenum uh, with a focal track layer of 10% uranium and 90% tungsten. Uh, so one thing to keep in mind is that it's 10% uranium and 90% tungsten for the focal track layer. I can transfer heat from the focal track very quickly. I cannot meet the needs of spiral helical CT and G deposit their weight. Uh, so while these uh, metal disc or the anode uh, can transfer heat really quickly, which is what we want, but it has too much weight. And so uh, the typical metal might as well exit all because it's not used. Uh, the brazed graphite anode disc consists of a tungsten aluminum focal track brazed to a graphite base body. So if we go back an image, I will see that we have a tungsten aluminum focal track brazed to the graphite body. And so basically uh, it's sitting on top of the graphite body, which as we all know graphite makes things very lot. And so it's capable of being the needs for CT. Graphite increases the heat storage capacity because of its high thermal capacity, which is about 10 times that of tungsten. So we even have more heat capacity. Uh, the material used in the brazing process influences the operating temperature of the tube, and the higher temperature results and higher heat storage capacities and faster cooling of the engine. So basically, this material used for the brazing process will affect how the tube actually performs. Uh, so let's put this here. Affects tube performance. So keep that in mind. The brazing process will have a a good or bad effect on the tube performance. Uh, tubes for spiral helical scanning are mostly based on this type of design. Uh, so we see that this raised uh, graphite disc is what we typically find in the CTs. Uh, the final type of anode design is also used or intended for use in spiral helical CT scanner. Uh, the disc consists of a graphite body. The disc consists of a graphite base body with a tungsten aluminum layer uh, deposited on the focal track by the chemical vapor process. Uh, so, what you need to know is that there is this chemical vapor process which ultimately uh, allows us to have this anode to actually uh, originate. Uh, this design can accommodate large, lightweight discs. So we can have very large and also lightweight disc with large heat stores and also fast cooling rates. So uh, this meets all of our requirements because we need a large disc so that we can have uh, more current or more photons produced. But we also need a lightweight disc so that we can actually have it uh, function in computer tomography, especially for helical scanning. But we also have to have the highest heat storage capacity so that we can 
uh, continuous scanning for long amounts of time, but we also have to have the ability to cool down very rapidly. So this one has uh, pretty much everything that we need. A rotation speeds of 10,000 RPM are possible with increased frequency to the stator winding. A smooth rotation of the uh, disc is possible because of the ball bearings lubricated with silver. And so, um, in the stator, we have ball bearings that are lubricated with silver. A ball bearing technology results in mechanical problems and limits X-ray tube performance. So one, once again, this is one of the classic conundrums of this book. It tells you that you have uh, ball bearings which are lubricated basically with silver to decrease the, the amount of friction and increase fluidity of motion. But then it also tells you that ball bearings are not used. So basically what, what you need to know is that ball bearings really are not used because of inefficiency. and also friction because uh, whenever you have two surfaces gliding on each other uh, regardless of how much you attempt to decrease the friction uh, there's still going to be some degree of friction on it and because of this and the ball bearings if you have a ball bearing that fails uh, then it can really tear apart your, your tube uh, very quickly so that's kind of the reason why ball bearings are not used as much nowadays. Uh, therefore, a liquid bearing method has been developed to reduce these effects. Uh, this is very interesting. Uh, liquid bearings, uh, probably something that you've never heard of before. Uh, but what happens is uh, the stationary shaft the anode assembly consists of grooves. So you have grooves uh, that contain delimium. Uh, based metal alloys. And so when anode rotation occurs, a liquid is forced into the grooves. So the liquid goes into these grooves and results in a hydroplaning effect between the anode sleeve and the liquid. And so uh, because of this, when motion starts occurring, liquid is forced into these grooves, forcing it to act as a bearing, but not actually a bearing. And so, basically, uh, you reduce friction down because it's a liquid, and as we know, liquids really can't uh, cause themselves to become lodged in things and destroy the anode in the tube. And so this is a very effective way to do this. And the purpose of this technology is to combat, or con uh, combat heat production and to basically uh, conduct heat away from the X-ray tube. Um, and so, basically, as once again, friction causes heat. So, uh, you can just pretty much write this friction equals heat. And heat is our enemy in terms of CT. It uh, decreases the amount of throughput that we can have and actually uh, the top scans that we can apply. And so, anytime that you can reduce heat uh, or by reducing friction, that's, that's something to be considered. And so this actually even allows uh, more improved tube cooling. So that's something, uh, and actually it's a win-win situation for everyone involved in this. Uh, additionally, the liquid bearing technology is free of vibrations and noise. Uh, sometimes when bearings get wore out, you can have vibrations um, and noise. Uh, I don't know if you've ever had a wheel bearing go out of your vehicle, but if you have, then you know that there are sometimes vibrations in your car, and also that there will be a tremendous amount of noise as the bearings can go out. And because of that, it's essential that you replace the bearings. Well, you can't do that in, C in CT uh, because if you had to do that so many times in CT, basically you might as well just throw the tube away, get you a new tube. And so it would wear the tube out very quick. And because of that, uh, you, you would have to replace tubes probably at least once or twice a year. Additionally, the liquid bearing technology um, has extended the life 
of the CT2 uh, from about 10,000 to 40,000 average. Uh, so a lot of times we don't think about what uh, 10,000 to 40,000 arrows is, uh, but that is quite a long time. Uh, if you if you consider the amount of scans that you do, uh, we will quickly achieve this probably over the course of a year uh, if we only had a thousand hours, which are what conventional X-ray tubes are using our rating uh, rated at, which have to be used for bearing technology. So basically, your conventional X-ray tube, if we just took your tube from a normal x-ray machine and put it on the CT, uh, we, we wear it out very rapidly because of the bearing technology inside of it. And that's because uh, the friction that would occur in heat produced. Uh, but also, going back to the 10,000 hours versus the 1,000 hours, it may not seem like a big, huge difference. But when you think about conventional radiography tubes, uh, pretty much you don't have exposures that are longer than milliseconds. And so uh, it would be a long time to actually acquire 10,000 hours. However, in terms of CT, we have scans that range uh, 20, 30, sometimes even 40 seconds. And so if that's the case, then we would build up a large amount of these hours very quickly. And we would have to replace the tube at least once a year. And so it would be very inefficient at 1,000 hours. So that's where we have a larger life expectancy for uh, CT tubes versus normal conventional X-ray tubes. Uh, so on this image, uh, we have basically the ceramic insulators. Here, we can see that we have the metal tube or metal envelope here. Uh, we have the anode. Then we have uh, pretty much the stator. And inside of this, we have a direct oil form of spiral groove bearing. And so we have the bearing situated somewhere in this area, which is the liquid bearing. Uh, this image uh, shows your anode. And then you have your stationary shaft here. And then you have uh, your grooves inside, which are these little areas like this, which basically uh, allow fluid to be spun inside of them and create a hydroplane effect. So as as the anode rotates this way, uh, the fluid is going to be slung out and allow this hydroplane effect to occur. Uh, so looking at this, uh, we see that we have rotation this way and this way. And so uh, we have cathode and we have the anode. And so the anode is spinning one way. And then we have the mission of the fan being the apex sphere. And that's pretty much all you really need to know here. Or well, also you you would like, I'd like you to know the electron beam that is going and striking the anode to produce X ray photons. Uh, that's another thing to actually look at. And so, uh, basically, what we have is type A and type B. We have a conventional anode which heats up quickly during exposure. And then we have the conventional anode cools down slowly after exposure. So
So that brings us to filtration. Uh, many of you may ask, why is this important? And uh, this is a very important point of computer tomography uh, because it is essential to polychromatic beam. And when we mean poly, associate it with the word many. And so when you have a poly, polychromatic beam, that uh, means many energies. And you want this to have an appearance of a monochromatic beam to satisfy the requirement of the reconstruction process. And to do that, you have to use a filter. So the twofold purpose of CT filtration is that filtration removes long wavelength. Uh, so you're wanting a long wavelength, which means something like this. This is long wavelength. Okay, and this is short wavelength. This primarily would be more short wavelength than the other two. Um, and so we see that these long wavelengths, uh, photons, actually don't contribute anything to the image quality, but they only yield a higher pace of dosage. Uh, so we want to remove these to eliminate patient dosage. Because as we all know, one of the biggest concerns with computer tomography at the moment is what kind of doses are we actually yielding to our patients. And so as a result of filtration, the mean energy of the beam increases and the beam becomes what we like to call harder, which may cause the beam hardening artifacts. But for the moment, don't worry about uh, beam hardening artifacts. Uh, but we'll talk about these when we get into algorithms. So don't worry what they are. But know that you can you can cause what we like to say be part of the artifacts. Uh, just know that this exists. Uh, but basically, what happens is we take away the long wavelength, so we get rid of what we have here, and we gravitate towards this. And so we have uh, only photons going through that actually would yield uh, beneficial uh, diagnostic quality for the patient. And this is only accomplished by filtration, which removes the low energy or long wavelength x-rays and only allows the short wavelength or high energy x-rays to actually go through towards the patient. A filtration also shapes the energy distribution across the radiation beam, produce a uniform beam hardening when x-rays pass through the filter and the object. And so you're, what we're looking for is a uniform type of beam. And so that's what you really want to look for and what the purpose of filtration is. Uh, you want a uniformity across the board. Uh, in CT, the inherent filtration has a thickness of about 3 millimeters, uh, aluminum equivalent. So we're looking at 3 millimeters here for thickness. Uh, the added filtration, on the other hand, consists of filters that are flat or shaped filters made of copper sheets. Uh, their thickness can range from a tenth to a uh, four tenths of a millimeter. Uh, today, specially shaped filters conform uh, to the shape of the object. And so, uh, based on what type of scanning is being utilized, uh, that will uh, demonstrate what type of filters. Uh, there are, these filters are called shape filters, and we have such things as bowtie. This is where our bowtie filter uh, that falls in place. Uh, they're usually made of Teflon, which will not have a large impact on beam hardening. So it attempts to reduce the amount of beam hardening artifacts here. Uh, filters are positioned between the X-ray tube and the patient. The shape of the beam can produce more uniformity at the detectors. So out of everything, I want you to just know that filtration equals Uniformity. That's what you need to keep in mind. Uh, if you get nothing else from uh, this lecture, 
uh, about filtration, just know that filtration increases the amount of uniformity that we have. And uniformity is a good thing that we need. And so uh, on this image, we have step one, step two, and step three. And so uh, what we have here is basically uh, the photons that are coming uh, straight from the anode. And uh, initially we have everything. We have varying degrees of energy. We have some that are high energy, some that are low energy. And so as we get to the point here, um, we're, we're going to say that this area here is where our filter is going to be. And so we see that uh, initially as we come from the anode, uh, sometimes we lose a little bit uh, of our long wavelength. So some of our long wavelength leaves, but we still have these here, which are still considered to be long wavelength. And so uh, even without filtration, we see that we have uh, a decrease in the amount of low energy x-ray beams. Uh, or x-rays that are contributing to the beam. But we also have uh, the beam becoming more penetrating or harder. And so uh, this is just even without any filtration the beam has become harder. But we have filtration here. So uh, filtration is existing here, and we see that we have an elimination of all of the shorter wavelength, or, or, or I mean, longer wavelength, or low energy photons, and we've actually uh, pretty much hardened the beam to where all that's getting through to the patient, which we're going to say the patient is here. So the only thing that's getting through to the patient now is short wavelength or high energy photons uh, with the exception of a few that are not uh, as penetrating but those have been decreased and so we see that uh, ultimately this results in a harder beam and so and what I want you to associate harder beam with is greater average energy. And so the harder the beam, the more energy that they have, which they can penetrate the patient even further. And so that, that's something to keep in mind about filtration. Uh, without filtration, uh, if there were if there were no filtration, then hypothetically step three would not exist and uh, you would have a larger patient dose because you would be getting a long wavelength radiation that really didn't contribute to the fact that the patient had been increasing the doses. Uh, so that brings us to collimation. Uh, we all know that collimation is very important uh, in conventional radiography. And the purpose of collimation in uh, conventional radiography, as we all know, is to protect the patient by restricting the beam of the anatomy of interest only. And so it's a restricting process in conventional radiography. Uh, where you don't allow the beam to go anywhere that you don't want it to be. Uh, in CT, collimation is equally important because it affects patient dose and its quality. Uh, so, very similar to what we have in conventional radiography because it does affect dosage and its quality. Uh, the basic collimation scheme in CT has adjustable pre patient, post patient collimators, and pre detected collimators. Uh, these detectors must be perfectly aligned. To optimize the imaging process. Uh, this alignment is accomplished with fixed collimators. And so uh, it allows, uh, once again, only the photons to go where we want them to go. A uh, prepatient collimation design is influenced by the size of the focal spot of the x ray tube because of the number of effects associated with focal spots. So, uh, prepatient. 
is think about the size of the focal spot. So those are what you want to associate with. The larger the focal spot, the greater the number, and the more complicated the design of the collimators. In general, a set of collimator sections is carefully arranged to shape the beam, which is proximal to the focal spot. So basically all you need to know about prepatient collimators is they are influenced by the size of the focal spot. Both proximal and distal collimators are arranged to ensure a, a consistent or constant beam width at the detector. Detector collimators also shape the beam and remove scatter radiation. So we increase our image quality with the removal of scatter radiation. And so this improves axial resolution. And distal collimator sections help define the thickness of the slice of the image. So your detector or your post patient collimators are what really helps define slice thickness. And so uh, pre patient. Focal spot, post patient, the slice thickness. So that's something to keep in mind here. So that brings us to our detectors. Uh, detectors exhibit several characteristics essential to the CT image production. Number one, and keep this in mind, start of this, uh, efficiency, which refers to the ability to capture, or, uh, capture, absorb, and convert X-ray photons to electrical signals. And so CT detectors must possess high capture efficiency, absorption efficiency, and conversion efficiency. And so uh, what we mean by efficiency is What do you do What do you do with photons? Okay, uh, so what do you do with photons? Do uh, you have a lot of photons bombarding detectors and the detectors not being able to capture them. Uh, and then do you have a lot of detectors that can take all, all of these photons but they cannot convert them to electrical signals fast enough. And so any, any anything that's not efficient uh, in terms of image quality and image production in terms of CT really cannot be utilized because we, we are giving the patient X amount of radiation and we do not want to uh, let that dosage go in vain. A capture efficiency refers to the efficiency with which the detectors can obtain photons transmitted from the patient, the size of the detector, are facing the beam and distance between two detectors to determine capture efficiency. And so uh, keep this in mind. Uh, that Basically what determines capture efficiency is the size of the, de the detectors and the distance between the detectors. So basically, uh, we all know that, let me draw this a little straighter, if this is a detector, and this is a detector, versus Which detector is going to be more efficient? It's going to be these because they are larger and there's a smaller distance. So we also we look at the size and the distance in between. Uh, whereas there is a larger distance here and the detectors are smaller, and so uh, there would be a more potential for a photon to go into an area where there is no detector. 
Uh, the absorption efficiency uh, refers to the number of photons absorbed by the detector and depends on the atomic number, physical density, size, and thickness of the detector base. And so, uh, basically, uh, it's how many photons can you absorb. And so keep in mind what is actually controlling absorption efficiency. Stability is something else that we look at. It refers to the steadiness of the detector response. If the system is not stable, frequent calibrations are needed to render the signals useful. So basically, you will have to use a calibration over and over and over again to actually make the scan mean something. And so that they the detectors quickly become uncalibrated. Also is the response time. And it is it refers to the speed at which the detector can detect an X-ray event or an X-ray photon and then be ready to detect another photon. And so how can you how how short of amount of time does it take to recover or to go from one photon to the next photon because as we know you're, the, the detectors are constantly being bombarded, being bombarded with photons and it's essential that they be able to uh, recover very quickly and be able to detect photons at a rapid pace. And the dynamic range is the ratio of the largest signal to be measured to the precision of the small signal to be discriminated. And so basically uh, what is the largest amount or largest range of photons that you can have and what is a small signal that you can actually produce. Uh, to the total def total detector efficiency or dose efficiency is the product of the capture efficiency, absorption efficiency, and conversion efficiency. Another important thing uh, that you want to keep in mind is this. Uh, put a star by this. Uh, afterglow. It refers to the persistence of an image even after the radiation has been turned off. And so basically, even after there are no photons hitting the detector, how long will the detector continue to give off uh, a reading like it, like it is receiving photons? Uh, CT detectors should have low afterglow values such as a one hundredth of a percent, uh, 100 milliseconds after the radiation has been terminated. So uh, within just a few uh, milliseconds, the radiation, the, the afterglow has stopped. And so this is what we're looking for uh, really in terms of CT. So afterglow is a very important thing. Uh, you definitely do not want uh, the, the detectors to still be uh, receiving or sending off information like there is uh, images being required or that radiation is being uh, utilized here. Uh, we do see that there are two types of detectors. Uh, there's scintillation and gas ionization detectors. Uh, scintillation detectors convert x-ray energy into light and then the light is converted into electrical energy. Uh, gas ionization detectors convert X-ray energy directly into electrical energy. So solid state detectors uh, that consist of a scintillation crystal coupled uh, to a photodiode tube. When X-rays fall onto the crystal, flashes of light or scintillations are produced. The light is then directed to the photomultiplier, which then releases extra uh, or electrons. Uh, these electrons cascade through a series of diodes, which are carefully arranged and maintained at different potentials to result in a small output signal. So basically, we use uh, scintillation detectors, which are solid state, um, to detect the X-ray photons and then to produce electrical signals which go by the way of flashing lights or scintillations uh, which go to a photomultiplier which release electrons corresponding to the scintillations. 
Uh, Scintillation material currently used with photodiodes are cadmium tungstate. And ceramic material of high purity, rare earth oxides. Based on doped rare earth compounds such as yttria, gadolinium oxysulfide, ultrafast ceramic. The conversion efficiency and photo capture efficiency of cadmium tungstate are 99 and 99%. And the, and the dynamic range is 1 million to 1. On the other hand, the absorption efficiency of ceramic rare earth oxide is 99%, whereas its scintillation efficiency is three times that of cadmium tungstate. We also have gas ionization detectors, which are based on the principle of ionization. It was introduced in the third generation of scanners. And the basic configuration consists of a series of individual gas chambers, usually separated by tungsten plates, carefully positioned to act as electron collection plates. So we see that when x-rays fall on the individual chambers, ionization of the gas results and produces positive and negative ions. So you're going to have production of positive and negative ions. Uh, the positive ions migrate to, to the negatively charged plate. So positive goes to negative, and negative goes to positive. Uh, this migration of ions causes a small signal current that varies directly with the number of photons absorbed. It is important to note, though, and it's important to put a star here, that with the introduction of multi-slice CT scanners uh, with their characteristic multi-row detector array, gas ionization detectors and fourth generation CT systems are not used anymore. So, basically, uh, gas ionization does not work with our new scanners. So, the uh, biggest thing to keep in mind, uh, not to focus too much on gas ionization because uh, it's no longer used. And so uh, that brings us to multi-row, multi-slice detectors. The goal of multi-row, multi-slice uh, detectors is to increase the volume coverage, speed, performance of both single slice and dual slice CT. The MRMS detectors consist of one detector with rows of detector elements. A detector with n row will be n times faster than the single row counterpart. A multi-row, multi-slice detectors are solid-state detectors that can acquire 4 to 64 to even 320 slices per 360-degree rotation. So um, keep that in mind. This is really what we're wanting to look at. And it is fairly obvious that the number of slices obtained per 360-degree rotation depends on the number of, det of detector rows. Multi-row, multi-slice detectors. Uh, multi-row CT detectors fall into two categories, namely matrix array detectors and adaptive array detectors. Uh, so keep in mind you have matrix array and adaptive array. Uh, the matrix array detector is sometimes referred to as a fixed array detector, and it, can, and it contains channels or cells that are often referred to as equal in all dimensions. Uh, they're sometimes referred to as being isotropic, meaning the same. Uh, they, uh, the average adaptive array detector, on the other hand, is anti-isotropic or anti-isotropic in design. Uh, this means that the cells are not equal, but rather they have different sizes. And the overall goal of isotropic imaging is to produce improved spatial resolution in both longitudinal and transverse planes. Uh, however, we typically favor the adaptive array over uh, the fixed or matrix array, meaning that we have different cell sizes. And we'll see that uh, uh, throughout our lectures that uh, we typically use adaptive array detectors. So data acquisition and sampling. 
During data acquisition, the radiation being transmitted through the patient falls on the detectors. Each detector then measures or samples the beam intensity on it. If enough samples are obtained, artifacts such as streaking appear on the reconstructed image. To solve this problem, methods have been developed to help with this, such as slice thickness, closely packed detectors, and double dynamic focus. And we'll really key in on these two in our future lessons about slice thickness and closely packed detectors and how that helps uh, increase uh, the resolution and uh, overcome the problems with data acquisition. So that is it.